Welcome to The Dope, an online travel magazine committed to the cause for, of uh, sustainability uh, in the travel industry. I'm Shobha Mohan. Um, uh, I champion the cause along with uh, The Dope. This is a, uh, this is a subject, uh, this is uh, an issue very close to my heart and uh, we've been interviewing a lot of people who are uh, who have been uh, stalwarts uh, in sustainability, in regenerative travel, uh, in conscious travel. So we've had lots of people we've interviewed. We've had a wildlife researcher. We've had uh, uh, we had uh, somebody who uh, has built a hundred percent eco hotel uh, in India. Uh, we've had various kinds of people who've joined us, and today we have with us uh, Chris Baker. Uh, from Denver. He is the founder owner of One Seed Expeditions. Welcome to the show, Chris. Yeah, sure, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to see you. Uh, One Seed Expeditions, it's a very interesting um, name. And the whole thing about seed takes you, um, you know, uh, takes you back to thinking about seed funding. It's about growth. It's, you know, it's about putting that little, um, you know, that little idea into people that can flourish into larger things. So. How did the name come about, One Seed? Yeah, so One Seed Expeditions, um, we were about two things. We're about exploring the world and investing in people. Yeah. And the name One Seed comes from the concept of, of planting seeds and the idea that um, big things can come from really small starts. Um, and it also refers to the concept of seed capital, which entrepreneurs anywhere in the world, whether you're in Kathmandu or Denver, Colorado, or anywhere else, you know, you have an idea, you have the hustle to make that idea work, um, but oftentimes uh, you also need access to capital. And so what One Seed does and why we exist is to use the power of travel, specifically adventure travel, to fund small scale loans for entrepreneurs around the world. And so that's where our, our name comes from. And that's really the core of everything that we do is how can we take this powerful thing of travel and invest it in this equally powerful thing of entrepreneurship and creativity and supporting individuals all over the world. Fantastic. And uh, you started in 2011, right? Before that, you were uh, studying and working in Nepal. I, I read about that. So uh, how, did, how did you move from uh, a student uh, and uh, you know, how did you move from a student to becoming an entrepreneur? Yeah, so it, it goes all the way back to, you know, when I was 18, I was like a lot of 18 year olds, really excited about, you know, exploring the world and getting out places. And also like a lot of 18 year olds, I had absolutely no marketable skills. Um, so I went out and I, I thought, what's the furthest place I could possibly go from, from home? And I grew up in a small town in West Virginia in the, in the US. And um, yeah, I found a position teaching English in Nepal. Um, again, like a lot of uh, students my age, I thought, oh, I'll go to Nepal and I'll have a really great impact and I'll be able to do something positive. Um, and I showed up and typical of an 18 year old, I totally overestimated my abilities and yeah. um, realized that, you know, what I what I had to take from that experience was a lot of really great learning um, and, you know, was humbled by both the, the place and the the community that I was working community. in, um, and then decided to come back. Um, I was a, I was a pretty awful English teacher, um, but I fell for the place, and so I came back um, instead to do language study and research in anthropology. Um, so I spent a lot of my early twenties living, working, doing research in Nepal, um, spending a lot of effort, uh, you know, securing research fellowships and grants, but all to get up in the mountains and, and spend as much time as I could in the Himalayas. Um, so I really fell for the place and, and I don't think that was really unique. You know, lots of people go there and, and are, are, you know, sort of awed by how beautiful the Himalayas are and how wonderful the, the people of Nepal are. Um, but I was there working and, and spending a lot of time up in the Kumbu region around Mount Everest and um, doing research there and, uh, you know, watching each day 
both the incredibly positive, powerful force of tourism. Um, so people coming from all over the world, spending a ton of effort to get to these really beautiful places, um, but also seeing how the benefits of tourism often didn't align with where those impacts were being felt. And so, um, you know, sitting along the, the trail up to, to Everest Base Camp, um, watching travelers, you know, by the hundreds um, walk up every day, um, but often seeing that the majority of that, that economic opportunity that was coming from that experience um, was not being felt in the place that was bearing the Absolutely environment and social cost of yeah. that place. Um, and so I was there in see, 2007 again as a uh, fellow with an organization called Kiva, um, helping to coordinate some of the funding relationships with microfinance partners there. Um, so looking within microfinance specifically at, at a lot of agricultural and, and livestock loans. Um, so in Nepal, the loans that we were administering were anywhere from two to four hundred uh, dollars. Um, and going out each day and meeting with borrowers and seeing just how much could be generated in terms of positive outcomes um, by really creative, in, in this case, women entrepreneurs um, who are using small amounts of capital to grow their farming operations or to grow their livestock operations. And so I had these two things um, that I was getting to experience when I was in Nepal, the force of travel, but also the, the yeah, energy and, the, and yeah. creativity of entrepreneurship. And I've, I've always been entrepreneurial myself. I've always kind of had some sort of side hustle, whether I was in school, I was selling, you know, snacks and sodas during breaks, or I wow. was in college, always selling books and just, just doing something to, um, to make, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, goodbye. And so yeah. the idea for one was how do we take these two things, you know, the power of travel and use that as a funding opportunity for uh, small scale entrepreneurs. Um, and that's yeah. where the idea so, really came from. Yeah. So uh, the, one of the things that you, you mentioned is that, uh, the tourism, I mean, the number of the numbers that go towards, uh, the Everest, um, mm -hmm. one would think that, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of people. I mean, small hotels, homestays, uh, mm -hmm. small uh, small shops selling uh, you know breads and tea and things. So these were these people must have flourished, right? They do they flourish and renting equipment. So I, I see a lot of that in the area. So uh, your idea is not only these people; it should flow out of the tourism ambit and go into other areas. And you can see that firsthand um, in a place like you know, the Kumbu Valley, where if you are fortunate enough to live along the trekking route, um, you have access to those opportunities. You have access to the market that's that's moving through your, uh, your village or your town. Um, but if you happen to live, you know, one or two valleys over, um, you're cut off from that. And yeah, that, that's a very concrete example of the bigger problem that we're often trying to solve, which is entrepreneurs in general are often excluded from markets um, and they're excluded from those markets either because of access or because of access to capital. Um, and so we're trying to, again, bring in opportunity to folks who are oftentimes marginalized in those situations. The people who are involved in the tourism, those are also community people, right? So that is a, that is a, you know, like a, like a natural outcome. So yep. if you're selling uh, trekking equipment or you're selling tea and snacks for the trekkers mm -hmm. setting out or, uh, you know, whatever that uh, tourism demands or travelers demand that. So this has to be a deliberate idea to look at mm -hmm. other uh, opportunities where you can help, right? Uh, something yeah. that does not fall in the direct ambit of travel. So yep. how do you how do you choose those things? There must be so many uh, opportunities, so many people. So do you choose one? Uh, uh, is there only a, uh, is there one um, uh, you know one area that you choose, or are there you know how do you how do you go about choosing a project to support? Yeah, so we we look at both of those things. So we look at both. Um, we describe as sort of those, those natural beneficiaries. Yeah. Um, so for us, those are all of our vendors. That's our supply chain. Yeah. Um, and that's an area that I think initially we we underestimated the impact that we could have there. Um, yeah. But over the years, um, and as part of our, our certification as a B Corp, um, we looked at how do we not only through our microfinance uh, lending program, but also through our supplier selection in yes. every part of our supply chain, how do we maximize impact there? Mm -hmm. So on that side of things, um, we prioritize a couple of different areas. We look at, at ownership, 
um, with an emphasis on local ownership. Um, and that's defined by where is that economic impact um, mm. felt and the economic benefit being retained. Um, so we look at ownership, we look at environmental stewardship. So how is that particular lodge being a good steward of the place that we both have a, a mutually vested interest in preserving? You know, that, that trail is only going to be valuable to both of us if we take care of it. So how do we prioritize lodges that do that? And then we look at underrepresented communities um, within those sectors. So you know, who is oftentimes benefiting the most in these scenarios and who is often uh, being marginalized Space the most. And marginalized, how we, yeah. yeah, and how can we help through our purchasing power shift that a little bit? Um, we're never going to be big enough to fix the problem on our own. Um, but what we can do is through our purchasing decisions is move that dial a little bit in the direction that we feel like it should be moving. And, and, and as a service to our customers, allow them to think about every dollar that they spend as a traveler, as a vote, of their principles and where they want that to go. Um, and so that's what we do on the supplier selection side. Uh, okay. And then on the microfinance side, we work with really great nonprofits in each of the places that we work. Mm -hmm. uh, and through those nonprofits- So you work with nonprofits, you don't directly work with a community. Exactly, yep. Okay, so do you set up the nonprofit or do you choose a nonprofit? We choose an existing nonprofit um, okay. that has a micro lending program. Okay. And we do that for a couple of reasons. Um, number one is just because of scale. Um, okay. you know, the process of administering small business loans. Yeah. Um, we're talking about very small amounts of money with really big user bases. So you need a lot of, of loans to actually make it worthwhile. Yeah. Um, and also expertise. We know that, say for a loan in, in Kathmandu, um, the best judge of whether or not that individual entrepreneur is going to be successful with that say that poultry operation that they're hoping to, to expand. To expand. Uh, it's not going to be me in Denver. Um, it's going to be their fellow community members in that context. And so we always prioritize working with existing nonprofits. And we're, we're sort of agnostic in terms of the, the businesses themselves. Um, we focus oh, much, okay. more on, much more on the people. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And in, in places like um, uh, Nepal, for example, uh, the loans are uh, done through a, a social guarantee. So five entrepreneurs will come together and they will guarantee each other's loans, which is a really good initial check on, is this a good business idea? Because that individual entrepreneur now has four other neighbors that are able to say, yes, that's a good idea, or no, this maybe isn't a good idea. Um, and then in some locations, like in Tanzania, we work with a, a startup incubator program. So they go through a pretty long uh, business development program, development and program. into that they're given those loans. Um, yeah. So we always rely on that. Oh, so every every country has a different model, you know, that suits uh, the needs of the exactly. country. Oh, exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, how do when you when you set out the program when you mm -hmm. when you design say a trekking program? See, I think yep. you have about thirty trips, right? In a year, yep. you run about thirty trips, and uh, yep. you do you lead a, many of them? Do you do you go with me myself? Group? Not not these days. Um, so all of our trips are are led by really amazing local guides. Um, so in the oh, okay. So uh, in 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 the in the respective uh, uh, countries. Exactly. Yep. Oh, so, so, so they so all have to fly to Kathmandu, and there they'll be met by the local guides. Is is that how exactly. it works? Oh, fantastic! Exactly. So yep. they don't so need a trip leader from uh, starting from you know Denver mm -hmm. or wherever they are. Okay. No. Yeah, so all of our trips in Chile are run by our staff in Chile and Peru and Tanzania. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, because we know like the, the absolute most important part of the experiences that we provide um, yeah. is the guide. Uh, nothing works without really great guides. Um, yeah. So we spend a lot of time and effort on getting those really great guides, hanging on to those really great guides, um, yeah. because that for us is that's the key to every trip. You know, fantastic. it's adventure travel. Things yeah. are going to go sideways. Buses are going to get missed. Absolutely, know, yeah, 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 yeah. So, is this is this soft adventure? You know, Everest must be pretty intense, right? Yeah. So our our sort of uh, difficulty zone goes from you know lighter trekking. A, a soft trip for us is usually a three to five day trek. Um, but you know, most most places you're you're carrying at least um, you know your day pack, um, and there's no there's no bail option, you know, it's very much if, if you're going to walk. Yeah. So there, there are definitely active adventures. Um, you know, our Everest Base Camp trip is 18 days, 15 days of trekking. Mm -hmm. um, we've got treks in places like um, Navarino Island and in, in Southern Patagonia, 
where you're fully self-supported, totally remote, you're carrying all your own gear. Yeah. Um, so we're definitely more on that side of things. Yeah. Um, and then because of that, the training of our guides is really important. So whether that's a wilderness first responder certification um, or... Uh, the, the guides, your, your guides are have the first responder certification. Okay. We work in some really remote places where even a, you know, a small injury is a, uh, a big to do if, if it happens. And, um, and those things do happen and we have to work really carefully to, to get yeah. folks out safely. And how big are your, uh, how big are you? I mean, trips I know are up to 15 days, right? right. So, yep. Some of your trips can go up to 15 days. But what's the size of your group? Yeah, so we cap most of our groups at 10. Um, so we like to keep our groups small. Um, our typical size is usually between seven and 10. Yeah. Um, and that works well for the types of adventures that we're doing because um, we've got to be able to move you know, cohesively and, um, yeah. and big groups just don't, don't work too well in the, in the back don't country. Don't work like too that. well, yeah. So 10, uh, and what kind of age groups are we looking at? Yeah, so our average traveler um, age is 33 um, okay. last year. Um, yeah. But we, we tend to have a lot of folks who are um, sort of in that 30 to 35 range. Um, that's our biggest um, bucket. And then our second biggest is sort of the um, 50 to 60 range. Um, mm. So those are like our two kind of uh, primary demographics. So um, one, of the, um, one of the things I, uh, you know, when you're, you're promoting uh, tours that are based on um, uh, enterprises like this or when mm-hmm. it, it is supported that it is supporting uh, a local NGO or uh, you know one of the uh, uh, initiatives that you have started uh, mm-hmm. marketing becomes a, I mean how do you how do you put this together as a marketing idea for the for their travelers how do you how do they sign up how do they uh, you know how do you pull them into the idea that they travel and their dollars are going to be benefiting someone because i think uh, you uh, the 10 percent of the travel cost goes to the uh, to the ngo right exactly yeah so i think for for us and for any social enterprise the task of marketing um is almost a, it's, it's a double lift because you need to not only communicate that the experience that we're selling is something worthwhile, something to get excited about and something to do. Um, but we also, at the same time, have to communicate a pretty complicated model in terms of how we work. Yeah. And we have to be really clear about communicating exactly what we do and what we don't do. Because as a social enterprise, I think there's a, a sort of uh, a natural risk of either overstating what you're doing yeah. Um, yeah. or sort of greenwashing um, yeah. your, yeah. your impact. Um, and so Kate, who, who does our, all of our marketing, um, I, always, I, I joke with her that she has an exceptionally difficult job because she has to do all these things at the same time. Um, and we have to keep to, it toned down and at the same time to say everything that needs to be said. Yeah, exactly. Because for us, like we, you know, oftentimes the, the marketing task for us is not to convince somebody that going to the Himalayas is a, is a thing to do. Most people, if they're thinking about it, they've already convinced themselves of that. They yes, that. yeah, obviously, yeah. What they're looking for is the right outfitter. Um, so they're looking for credibility um, and trust and the sense that, you know, this is the outfitter that I want to be with if something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and for a social enterprise is also, how do we build trust and transparency around what we do? And so we have to provide our travelers with a lot of information. So if you go into our site, you can see you know, where our loans are going down to the dollar, um, how these funds are being dispersed, um, what our, our principles are as a B Corp and how we select all of our vendors and our partners. Um, but we also can't overload travelers with this. So we yeah, have to this. give it to them in parts. And then um, what we found is that once travelers are on the trail, then that's a really great opportunity for them to take that deep dive and understand kind of what we are as a as a social enterprise whereas on the front end it's really like how do we it is travel you know, yeah exactly how do we it make just, clear that we're the right out for there absolutely and you know you i mean if it's a culture trip you, you are on steady ground right so yeah. you're only worried about one thing that you know that flights should be on time and things like that now yeah. i can see you balancing a lot Right. I mean, there shouldn't be a snowfall that, you know, stalls your trip. I mean, there must be so many of them. So uh, uh, tell me, uh, uh, you know, what is difficult to which of your destinations are tough to sell? I mean, you know, are are tough to promote. I would say in in every location we work, we typically have a 
kind of a main draw. So yeah. in eight in locations, Africa, right? You're in eight yeah. locations. Yeah. Yeah, so we, have, we have eight countries um, and we typically have that trip that for better or worse ends up being sort of a bucket list trip for somebody. You know, they want yeah, to do, yeah. they want to go to Everest Base Camp. They want to do uh, Machu Picchu or Kilimanjaro. Um, and so, yeah, so they're all, they're all uh, iconic trips everywhere. Yeah. And so our, our harder sell is usually getting people to push out beyond that. And so what we spend a lot of time doing is we'll, we'll develop a trip, say, to, you know, to Everest Base Camp. Um, but then we'll also develop some really amazing trips to areas um, within that same country, but that are often a little bit off of the, the, the radar. Um, and so it's a process of kind of pulling people into the destination to get them excited about it. About um, it. But people want two things when they travel. They want to go to the place that everybody's gone to and they've seen all the pictures of. Build that trust by showing that, you know, we, we work in only eight countries. We really try to develop expertise in those countries rather than yeah. trying to sell everything in the world. Everything in the world, yeah. So but in these eight countries, it'll be the iconic trips. I mean, just, Nepal yeah. is the Himalayas, you know, it's, it's just like that. And uh, uh, I mean, one question going back to the uh, to one of the things that you mentioned. Uh, so uh, when you're selling the Himalayas, it's mm -hmm. is it you have another smaller trip attached to it or I mean, what, what is what did that mean? Yeah, so sometimes we'll do, you know, extensions. So opportunities to extend your trip and do something a little bit unique on the front or back end. Um, okay. But other times it's also different itineraries. Um, so in Nepal, for example, you know, the, comparing the Manaslu circuit to the Everest base, base camp Good. trip. Um, okay. So know. when the, otherwise an Everest base camp, a camp trip is a, just an Everest base camp trip. There is no, nothing else added to it. The 15 days are taken up on the base camp trip. Is that it? Correct. So on that one, that's the route up and back. And then yeah. we'll do things like we'll modify um, parts of the itinerary to make sure that we hit certain spots or yeah. um, we really try to highlight certain partners along the way. Um, yeah. But then, yeah, it was always that balance of giving people exactly what they want in terms of yes. the trip that they've seen on Instagram, uh, but also giving them the trips that's that's unique and worthwhile and and. Luckily for us, we have a lot of repeat travelers. Of so the, yes, sometimes yes. they'll come with us the first time and then they'll say, okay, give me some advice on like, I want to have this type of experience. And then those are really fun things to work with. You know, two, two very important things when they are traveling. One is of course the, um, do they train for all these iconic trips? There must be some kind of training that they need because I know for Everest base camp, there is, there is training. We, we're always happier whenever clients train. Um, it yeah. makes everybody's trip a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we do a good job on the front end of, uh, you know, pre-sale, really explaining to a traveler yeah. what's what's involved in this trip. Um, and and we'll tell travelers, like, if, if they come and they say, you know, I don't really like hiking for long distances, we'll say, great, this is, we're not the right outfitter for you. There are lots of other trips that you can do with other outfitters. Um, we focus on trips that are physically demanding. Um, and in really remote areas. So that's the first step. And then yeah. after the, the booking and before the trip actually runs is really giving uh, travelers a clear sense of what to expect, how to train, mm -hmm. um, so that they're in the best possible um, shape whenever they start their trip. And for some people that means, you know, getting out a little bit more before they head out. For some people that, that might be a year long process of really meeting a big goal. Yeah. Um, and we meet travelers kind of wherever they are, but we, we do make it clear that like on the day of the trip, we're not, we're not going to carry up the mountain. Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta, get you have there. to walk into your exactly. it yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, one of the things on, on the Everest base, uh, the Everest base camp trip is the amount of garbage um, that, you know, it, it made a lot of news in the lights, making a lot of news in the last three, four years. So yeah. what is your, I mean, what is your experience been and how, I mean, are there any great initiatives that are happening that some of the companies are looking at and what would you, what are, what would you be doing? Yeah. So I, I think, um, unfortunately that's, it's not unique to Nepal. I think Everest always gets the, the attention. The if attention. anything, if somebody sneezes on Mount Everest, it's, it's news. Um, but I think any place that we we're going to that has a really, high attraction for travelers you're going to see that impact and so yes. um, we see that in Kilimanjaro we see that in Patagonia and each place 
we try to do a few things. We try to, to focus first on the, the preventative. And so we, we ensure that all of our guides uh, are Leave No Trace certified and then um, ensure that all of our travelers understand exactly what our expectations are for you know, physical waste on the trail. Yeah. Um, and then we, we make sure that our actual you know, steps and actions on the trail um, are sustainable and that we're not, leaving, um, we're not leaving a place any worse off than whenever we first got there. And then beyond that, when we look at how do we actually improve those places and how do we actually um, ensure that they are not just, you know, not getting any worse, but actually getting better, that's the part where we look at, you know, in Patagonia, for example, we, we participate in the annual trail cleanup where we're getting out there and actually cleaning up the trail. Yeah. But I think more deeply and, and beyond that is weaving in conservation and those ethics of conservation throughout the entire trip so that our travelers understand every single day you know they wouldn't even think about throwing something on the ground but they also are thinking about okay well how does how does the development of tourism in this place um, impact this location what are my actions as an individual having how can we think about again supplier selection and the partners that we work with um, we also uh, for 2020 um, and back in, in January we announced that um, we'll be going completely carbon neutral so we're working um, through a program through the ATTA to um, offset our, our carbon emissions for all of our trips on the ground and then offering that to, to travelers for their flights. So kind of thinking in all those different layers. Of uh, yeah. So offset things will largely be uh, plantations? Would, would you say that? How you... So there's, yeah, so there's a, um, there's a mix through, it's called Tomorrow's Air. There's a carbon sequestration project that, yeah. that um, ATTA has come around. And so we're participating in that. Obviously 2020, we're going to have a pretty low carbon impact because so few of our trips are actually running so right now. So that is true. <laughs> yeah, that is true. So but we, we spent all of 2019 uh, really developing the metrics around what are the impacts of every trip. So we know every trip, yeah, yep, yeah. Yep, by every itinerary, we, we looked at every, you know, mile that we drive in a Jeep, every, um, you know, piece of food that gets brought into the areas where we're working. So we looked at, so we knew what our baseline was, what our actual That's metrics it. were. Um, and that was kind of step one. And then step two is, is being able to actually offset those. Um, but it has to go beyond that as well. It, it's got to be Absolutely. part of we want our travelers to leave that trip thinking not just about that destination and how they can help preserve that, but also how they can do that in, in every decision of their travel and hopefully wherever they go next. Wherever they go next or however they live their lives. I mean, that's the whole idea of transformative travel, right? They, they take a few ideas that you have put into their heads, seeded those ideas into their heads and they go back home uh, knowing that they'll never go back to that, that way of life again like a big lifestyle change. I saw in there, um, in, um, in, your, uh, uh, in your profile that we must be the change. That's one of my favorite uh, quotes by Gandhiji. So, uh, right, yeah, be the change. Yeah, so, um, I mean, now, uh, there obviously 2020, I think there'll be no trips that you've not. So what are the guides doing? I mean, in all over the places, what about their livelihoods and what's up with all of them yeah so our you know our year came to a screeching halt in mid-march um, we were still in the middle of our himalaya season and wrapping up um our work in parts of south america um so we were you know in the middle of march we still had lots of trips out um, as borders started closing and as everything um came to a halt so our, our first task was getting everyone out and home safely um mm -hmm. and then after that you know we looked at you know, is this going to be a few months? Is this going to be many months? And I think like everyone, we've kind of had that line continue to move. You know, we thought, okay, by September, we'll be back. By November, we'll be back. And, and two of our locations are back and, and open for travelers again. Really? Um, uh, Tanzania. Um, Tanzania and, is open, yeah. Yeah, so Tanzania is open right now, and so is Croatia. Those are our two that are oh, open to U.S. travelers. Um, but what we did in, uh, this would have been in May, um, is we launched a, uh, a crowdfunding campaign for our guides. That was a, one of the first things we did. Um, yeah. We have, you know, sort of this built-in insurance network of really great uh, past clients. Um, our clients have, have always been there for us. Um, we had a, a similar experience um, in Nepal in 2015 uh, during the earthquake where, you know, we lost most of our season that year. Um, most of our 
we had about three quarters of our guides um, lose their homes. And so that was our first experience with something like this happening. And, and when that happened, all of our past clients reached out to us, how can we help? How can we how help? Can help? Um, yeah. And so we were able to, to raise uh, about $20,000 for our guides in Nepal during that. Um, and then we had the same thing happen this, this summer whenever uh, travel shut down. Our clients, because they're typically choosing to travel with us because of our social mission and they have that connection to our guides, um, they knew you know what was happening. And so um, we were able to do a crowdfunding campaign to help campaign. offset um, for, for the season. Um, and then now what we're doing every day is just trying to, to, to get um, ready. Um, so we're, we're yeah. busy, you know, working through COVID um, safeguards and, and health and safety guidelines so that when borders do reopen, um, we're ready and we're ready to do it the right way. Ready to go the right way. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely wonderful what uh, the vision that you have laid out for One Seed Expeditions. Uh, is there anything you would like to, um, you'd like to add something in all the work that you, in the, all the travels that you have done, anything travelers have shared, how do they feel about it? I mean, uh, what is their what is their reaction, and which which makes all of this worthwhile? You know, the experience for the traveler, the, the most satisfying part of this job for us is, you know, being out there on the trail with somebody who maybe thought that doing something like that was beyond what they were able to do, um, and to see them both realize, you know, how big the world is around them and how big the world is outside of their their daily experiences. Um, but also that they're capable of of doing that and and they're capable of having that experience and and you know pushing themselves beyond that that um, uh, you know where they what they think they might be able to do. Um, and then I think for you know the kind of the big picture and thinking about where do we go from here and what do we do you know following this moment um, because we're at this sort of pause, you know we're in this this place as a as an industry and you know us as a company. Um, where we are, we're on pause and we're trying to figure out, you know, what does, what does travel look like after this? Um, and I think there's both obvious challenges right now for everyone. Everyone is struggling through this, um, but there's also real opportunity. Um, and there's real opportunity to think about, you know, when we do get to travel again, and we do get to have these experiences, um, how do we express what our values are? through those travel choices. Um, and I think that that's going to be the mindset of a lot of travelers. Um, but I also think it's the opportunity for a lot of operators and a lot of um, you know, destinations to really rethink really what is the purpose of travel? Is it just to, you know, to grow our number of, of folks going to a certain location by X percent every year? Or is it to think about how do we create systems that, that actually benefit the places that that create all the value and protect and support the communities that um, that are there. And so, Absolutely. yeah, it's a big deep breath and I hope that it's not yeah, too the, um, yeah, the, the pause back. is just the time to seed that idea in everybody's head so that travel indeed becomes a, an extremely uh, beneficial thing, not only as a personal transformation, it also benefits the community and the destination. Exactly. I think you've been doing a fantastic job and just uh, just nine years and well done. And we really hope, um, you know, I, I hope you come to India and that will be really good to see you here as well. Uh, thank you for joining us, Chris. And, um, you know, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to you. And thank you for being such a sport to, you know, uh, it, take out time so early in the morning to be chatting with us. Uh, we hope um, we hope travel picks up for all of you and all your trips are on and we'd like definitely love to see uh, some of your trips happening and maybe some of uh, the our uh, travelers might even join in and uh, I think it's you're doing a really really a fantastic job and I think we, uh, what you rightly said that we must all be the change and that message is being um, you're being uh, able to deliver that message very adequately with what you've been doing so far really well done thank you, well, thank, you. thank you for having me on and um, yeah thank you for putting together this series it's been great to, to uh, learn what other folks in the space are doing and um, I think this is a great opportunity to do exactly this so thank you Great. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for um, listening to us. Uh, we had Chris Baker today and uh, 
uh, please uh, watch, share, and spread the word because that is how this wonderful idea uh, of uh, travel with a purpose and traveling with an intention to create a to uh, to create change and to make a difference is going to be spread far and wide. This is what will sow the seed for change in the travel industry.